So I'm Valentine Kedjou, and I'd like to welcome you all to the kickoff event for both Social Justice Week and Earth Month. So Valerie Chet, the Director of Social Justice Program and a Professor in Sociology, and I have worked together this is our first year, both of us directing our respective programs, and we had the great honor to have this event, and we're really grateful that you've all come to get it. So I'm going to let Valerie introduce Todd, but I wanted to first thank the many people who've helped to sponsor and make today possible. So in addition to the sustainability, social justice, and environmental studies programs, complex studies, global studies, model UN program, sociology, the School of Business, and the Hedgeman Center for Student Diversity Initiatives and Programs all helped to bring together today. And in addition, the Center for Teaching and Learning in the Library sponsored the launch that we just had with Todd. So thank you all for coming. We're gonna have this talk for the next hour. We realized that the in initial theatrical production of Social Justice Week starts at four. So for those of you who need to go, you're welcome to leave at four. But we'll continue to carry on the conversation as it's going. Great guns in here. We'll invite people to bring snacks in. And if we want to continue the conversation, there'll be a reception out by the Fulford Terrace sign on the other side of the Wellspring Meditation Room. So we hope you can all stick around and enjoy it. This is also, I believe, um, Hamlet Dining Services' inaugural event of trying to have a climate light catering menu. So we celebrate that as well. So I'll turn it over to Valerie. So, um, uh, as Valentine said, um, we are so excited to have Dr. Todd Beer here today with us to talk about climate justice and to really help us think through um, how this issue intersects with issues that we care a lot about on this campus, which includes issues about social equality and inequality environmental sustainability and social responsibility, global relationships, and our participation in movements for social change. Dr. Beer is an assistant professor of sociology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Lake Forest College, which is just north of Chicago. His teaching and research interests include the globalization of culture, climate change, climate justice, social movements, environmental sociology, race, and survey methods. His recent research includes surveying climate change activists at mass protests in New York City, and most recently in Paris. He also studies the relationship between environmental organizations in Kenya and global INGOs and the fossil fuel divestment campaign on college campuses. Dr. Beer is the recipient of numerous teaching awards, and his research has been published in the Journal of the Global South, Sociological Perspectives, in the International Journal of Sustainability and Higher Education. He received his PhD from Indiana University, and before that, he received his master's degree from Humboldt State University, and a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Dr. Beer also blogs about a variety of sociological topics on his uh, website called the sociologytoolbox.com. And on a more personal note, it's really in his role um, as a sociology blogger that I was first introduced to Todd at a conference several years ago. We were both, and we continue to be part of a small but growing community of sociology bloggers. And so while Todd is a very accomplished researcher and scholar, as we will see today, his commitment to teaching is equally as impressive, which is beyond evident in how actively and thoroughly he writes about these issues on his blog. Throughout his posts, readers can find innovative teaching ideas and strategies for how to make sociology relevant to students and the general public. At the end of every post, Dr. Beer closes with the same concluding sentence, which eloquently sums up his dedication to his students and to his scholarly craft. He writes, teach well, it matters. So with, uh, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Todd Beer. <laughs> out today. Uh, I'm going to talk about climate justice. And when we think about climate change, we often think of it as an environmental problem. This is primarily because when we think about the organizations that address climate change, 
we think about environmental organizations like Greenpeace, who most recently organized what they're now calling kayaktivists to blockade the port of Seattle to prevent this giant machine in the background there from going up to the Arctic uh, to drill for oil. Or we might think of it when we see uh, the website of the Sierra Club, which wants us to use, go move beyond oil and beyond coal to prevent um, oil spill disasters uh, in Alaska, the Exxon Valdez, and the BP oil disaster in the Gulf, to avoid that in uh, the Arctic Ocean, seemingly here to prevent harm to wildlife. Uh, lastly, we might think about it when we see one of the more prominent uh, environmental authors of our kind of generation, uh, Bill McKibben, kind of give up writing books, not totally, but in order to start a uh, grassroots environmental organization solely addressing uh, climate change. Here's Bill and my daughter and wife uh, in Paris. Uh, we got to meet him a couple of times, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we tried to brighten his day. Also, uh, if you ever do survey research, if you have a baby strapped to you, people can't say no, so you get much higher response. Um, now, in many ways, they're correct. Global, global warming is an environmental problem. The oceans are heating up, they are acidifying. Large coral reefs are dying. There was just a, in the news this week a uh, report about the great large swaths of the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia um, dying. The uh, ice sheets are melting in the Arctic, which means the hunting ground for the almost sure to be extinct in our lifetime. Uh, polar bear are shrinking, and scientists have predicted that we are headed for the sixth great extinction um, where uh, a mass of species will die off because the climate is changing faster than they can evolve. Uh, good news so far. All right, we might also think that climate change is a global problem. Uh, climate change, global warming, often now interchangeable in, in terminology, but it's kind of built in, right? Global warming. Let's think about it happening in the whole globe. We measure emissions of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse uh, heat trapping gases on a global level. We report uh, global average temperature increases, those kinds of things. But the problem is, if we think about it as an environmental problem, we miss a lot of the social uh, and political aspects of climate change. If we think about it as a global problem, we miss a lot of the variation and experiences of this <coughs> problem uh, based on individual communities often organized uh, into nation states on our globe, which are far from equal. How then is climate change a justice problem? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So what are some of the principles of justice? It's not my field, so you should take uh, classes with Valerie. But uh, generally, when we think of justice, we think of equity and fairness. It is unjust for one person to be treated differently by the law than the other person. Uh, fortunately, in today's world, if we look at justice globally and equality, we look at all human beings as equal. We have long, fortunately, moved past the overt and egregious belief that there are westernized Europeans and savage others to be enslaved or colonized. Uh, so justice it works on a global level now. We also think of justice when we think of responsibility of harm to others. We want justice when something has gone awry, when somebody has been harmed, when somebody steals something from us as an individual, when a company uh, or organization um, disposes of their toxic waste illegally, when, I don't know, let's make up something, like when banks uh, get people involved in um, bad mortgage loans and break down the entire economy. Um, we also think about social justice uh, when we think about uh, the distribution of goods or benefits and risks to society as a whole, uh, distributive justice. Is it fair, is it just for one person to accumulate billions uh, while others have uh, not enough to meet their basic needs? Those kinds of questions. So part of justice is some sort of punishment uh, those can come in the form of incarceration, right? We lock people up as a deterrent. You don't want to go to jail and have your freedoms as an individual taken away. Um, we might remove them from society to protect the rest of society. Uh, we may, you can't really lock up an institution or an organization though, so we may deliver fines in the tens of millions of dollars as a deterrent or as a form of restitution. Right, if you have been harmed or a community has been harmed by an organization, uh, justice may come in the form of 
finding that organization, and then that goes to uh, the victims of the harm that was done. So climate change, how do we get then from uh, this, these problems that are often looked at as an environmental, often looked at as global, where's the injustice, where's the harm, who are the responsible parties? This is what we're looking at when we ask questions about climate justice. So we might not see that, we, we only see that harm depending on how we look at what's happening or what the causes of climate change are. So if we look at, if we look at it globally, uh, this is C carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions since 1850 to 2010, measured in the millions of metric tons, uh, and the line is pretty clear. While there are little tiny dips, uh, for the most part, especially after World War II, globally, we are on a trajectory uh, that shows no signs of plateauing or the needed decline in those uh, emissions. However, we are a world made up of nations, and so we can look at national emissions um, and see that the United States line looks quite similar uh, to the global line, uh, maybe starts to grow a little bit more fast, faster earlier uh, on in the, in the 1900s, um, and we see a little bit of a dip there. That happens to coincide with, um, what are they calling it, the Great Recession. Um, Recessions are great for climate change if you're an advocate for decreasing emissions. <laughs> okay, other nations that we can look at, other major economies, China. Uh, depending on how you talk about it, um, or if you listen to Donald Trump, I guess, China is a big threat. Um, we've shipped a lot of our jobs there, a lot of our manufacturing, uh, so to speak. Uh, we see that for most of the 1900s, China was a great laggard to the United States, but then somewhere around 1980 uh, began to increase their emissions dramatically, and by the early 2000s, passed us like we were standing still and a 60 mile an hour car passed us. They, you can see how quickly uh, they skyrocketed above us. If you look at other major economies in the world, Japan, Germany, the UK, um, other largely populated countries like India, you see a little bit of a different story. So these other major economies, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, and UK being in the top five to top 10 economies in the world uh, behind the United States and China, especially the, those European countries you see grew some, I mean, from here to the 1900s, but then they plateaued and for quite a few decades have been at the same rate of emissions. They are still contributing to climate change, um, but it has not increased. Some of them are even, Germany is even slightly uh, going down there. What's the problem with measuring contribution to climate change by the na at the national level? Say again? Quantity of production. Um, well, okay, so you can measure, you can also measure climate change emissions in regards to its intensity. So how many emissions are you uh, emitting in relation to how much you produce? And the more efficient, right, the idea being that if you produce a ton, you're going to release a ton. But if you're more efficient at that, that would make a difference. But what else? There's a hand up in the back. Yeah. Uh, population. All right. Approximately population activity. Excellent. So China and the United States do not have the same population. Um, Japan and the United States. Japan and China do not have the same population. So the population of the U.S. is about 330 million. China is in the realm of 1.2, 1.3 billion, so four times the number of people than the United States. So when, we, when you hear the term, oh, China is the largest emitter of, of greenhouse gases in the world, that's true. They're also the most populous nation in the country. So we need to consider things, or many argue, that we, can argue, we need to measure or consider contributions to this problem in regards to per capita. So if we do that, we see some pretty dramatic changes here. China drops way down here, uh, below the United States, Japan, Germany, United Kingdom. And the United States is kind of an outlier. Uh, even though we are similarly uh, advanced and kind of our per capita GDP is similar to Japan and Germany and the UK, uh, our rate of emissions per person is much higher. And China is still well, well below us. So about uh, seven, I forget what these are, megatons, <coughs> Uh, per person compared to the U.S.'s, uh, you know, 16, 17 uh, there. So two to three times 
the rate per individual in the United States compared uh, to China. If we keep up the US and China there just for perspective and look at the distribution of some other countries on different continents, so in this case Africa, we see down here Mozambique, Sierra Leone, Kenya, Kenya, Ghana, and Zimbabwe are barely measuring on here. So they probably don't even get to one uh, megaton per person. South Africa, which is a little bit more developed economy, slightly above China. But we see impoverished nations contribute almost nothing uh, to the problem. Looking at another continent, some poor countries in Asia, Nepal, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, again, we can barely even see them because they're so close to zero. Vietnam begins to uh, tick up there um, a little bit. And lastly, if we look at South America, uh, again, you can kind of tell based on the level of development, Argentina and Chile appearing um, a little bit more visible there compared to Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, El Salvador, and Haiti. Same level since 1960. So our timeline did change here just because of the um, accessibility of this kind of data. But we see poor countries contributing much less to this problem. We can look at regions, right? So if we look at North America, the Canada, the United States, we see um, they are again kind of the leading uh, region of the world. Oceania, which is primarily, this number is primarily driven by Australia, Europe, and then we see Asia, Latin America, and Africa way down here. So we used to talk about the world in regards to first world and third world. Oftentimes the terms now are global north versus global south, different histories that make those kind of sweeping labels um, applicable in some cases. In this case, we see all of the regions of the global south kind of clustered in the bottom here, not contributing um, nearly the same amount to the problem of climate change. And lastly, we can look at climate change in a historical perspective. When we release CO2 and methane and others, it remains in the atmosphere. They're estimating, depending on the conditions, for anywhere from 20 to 200 years. So what we're emitting now, or the, um, let's flip that, the, the, um, the temperature increases that we are experiencing now, in part, are due to carbon that was emitted 50, 75, 100, maybe 200 years ago. So they've been able to calculate kind of our historical contribution. And once again, the United States is kind of an ugly outlier there um, between the dates of 1751 and 2006, contributing three times as much as China, Germany, the USSR, um, et cetera. So depending on how you look at it, uh, you will see then uh, the differences among regions and countries. So it's not just the causes, but also the consequences of climate change are uh, maldistributed. So the global south relative to the global north, it has lower levels of development. Uh, this matters because if the equivalent of Hurricane Sandy or something like that strikes New York and New Jersey, uh, that's one thing when it's hitting uh, steel skyscrapers, cement overpasses and things like that, versus if your housing is made out of a tarp or made out of mud and uh, grass roof, those kinds of things, it's gonna make a big difference in the impact. The idea of insurance, right? We think, oh, well, people have flood insurance, people have homeowner's insurance, that kind of stuff. Not in most of the world. If your property is destroyed in most of the world, that's it. Um, it's over. So the, uh, our, the rate of solid infrastructure, floods in Mozambique uh, in the last couple of decades uh, become more regular. Their roads get washed away uh, because of the lack of uh, construction material, etc. Largely in part because of public tax revenue is very different in other countries. So the government has less money to spend on um, things like that. The idea of building a seawall, right? For many countries, they're preparing uh, New York City, the tip of Manhattan is gonna have to build a seawall in order to prevent Wall Street from being flooded on a regular basis, these kinds of things. We can think of doing that. We can think of spending billions of dollars on infrastructure where other countries don't have that tax revenue. Additionally, other countries, particularly in the global south, have much higher rates of absolute poverty. Not like, oh, I can't afford premium cable, but like I don't have electricity, kind of poverty. So more people living a subsistence lifestyle, meaning they produce and grow everything they use. So think about that. Think about what skills and abilities and how you spend your time and what you consume, right? How many of us have ever grown any of our food? Yeah, maybe I had a basil plant on my shelf once, right? Um, we have gardens, 
but we certainly supplement that by going to the grocery store and things like that. Additionally, the Global South, uh, they're predicting, is going to be subject to the consequences of global climate change in a more dramatic fashion. So as the atmosphere heats up, it holds more water. So that means it rains less, so we have more drought cycles. But when it does rain, it floods, and it dumps and dumps and dumps. We've seen this in California this year after years of drought. Now we have tons of rain, tons of snow. We might say yay for the ski season out there, um, but mudslides, things like that. If you are a subsistence farmer and you don't have an irrigation system, if it doesn't rain, or if you don't know when it's gonna rain, your livelihood is over. If you take your crop, right, so a lot of the things that we eat are actually seeds, right, so beans, corn, things like that. They harvest that, they eat some of it, they save the rest for seeds. If for their entire life, it started to rain the second week in March, so that's, you know, they have to get the fields ready, they put the seeds in the ground, and now all of a sudden, because of climate change, it does not rain, or it rains and then it stops, and their crop dies, then they don't have those seeds to put in the ground anymore, they don't have insurance, they can't go live with their uh, parents, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, lower crop yields, they're predicting for the global south. Rising sea levels, again, yeah, we can maybe build some seawalls to prevent New York, uh, and Miami, well, Miami, no, but Miami, uh, New York, um, and those kinds of things for a little while. Um, other countries like Bangladesh have millions of people who uh, live at the poverty level that are at or below sea level. Uh, let's see, higher temperatures, there's predictions that, in, uh, that came out this summer that in parts of uh, Iran, it will be so hot during parts of the year that people will, I think it was like 120 degrees was gonna be the average, or something ridiculous like that. So just general higher temperatures. The frequency and strength of storms. So as the, as the atmosphere collects more water, uh, hurricanes are becoming stronger. Again, this is gonna have an impact if uh, you don't have the same kind of uh, infrastructure. Uh, Vector-borne diseases, as it gets warmer, the area of mosquitoes, right, which carry um, things like malaria, which is one of the leading killers in the world. We don't have malaria here in the United States. We used to, and it'll probably come back. Uh, you see the talk of Zika virus right now, which is really only a true danger for anyone who might be pregnant, but that's a good portion of the population. And as that spreads, as it gets warmer and warmer, as we have fewer hard freezes, you get more mosquitoes further and further north. Et cetera, et cetera, unfortunately. All right, so how is climate change a justice problem? It's a justice problem because there's disproportional causes and consequences um, of, of harm caused by climate change. So you see particular nations contributing to the problem much more than others. And um, in some court sort of like sad irony, right, the countries that are contributing to climate change are the ones that are most prepared to deal with it. Climate change is not something that's gonna happen when you're older, it's happening right now. Do we feel the effects of it? No, not very much. We can go inside during the summer if it gets too hot, flip on the AC. I don't know if many people bother to get AC up here, but um, you can flip on the AC if it gets too hot. Uh, we have housing structures that can prevent this. If there's crop failures in one part of the country, we can afford to buy crops from elsewhere, those kinds of things. But in other parts of the world, Climate change, or in other parts of the world where people have contributed very little to nothing to climate change, they are already being impacted um, by a light in a life-threatening way. So, how have we tried to deal with this as a globe? The United Nations brings together countries, most countries in the world, and in 1992 they formed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a, says, hey we're gonna to agree to get together to try and figure this out. That's all it said. So that started in 1992. And part of the text that they came up with recognized that nations had common but differentiated responsibilities. So hinting a little bit there at uh, climate justice. In 1995, they started negotiations to form a legally binding treaty among nations that would address the problem. And in 1997, they adopted the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol 
uh, took this common but differentiated idea and said, look, we will have 41 what they called Annex I nations. And those are nations like the United States, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, heavily industrialized nations. Those nations, we're going to ask you to commit to emissions reductions. The rest of you, you don't worry about this right now. You're still trying to develop. You're still trying to bring the majority of your people out of poverty. Keep developing. There were two commitment periods to reducing emissions. And generally, they asked countries to reduce 5 to 8% from whatever their level was in 1980 uh, by that point. In uh, 2005, Kyoto entered into force uh, in the world with 193 signatories, but not the United States. The United States never signed uh, the Kyoto Protocol. So this one phrase here, this common but differentiated responsibilities, that's pretty vague. That's not something to write a lot of policy uh, specifics from. So that one phrase we have been negotiating and grappling with and protesting about uh, for 23 years now, 24 years. And it still plays a role up until, well, currently and, and even in last year's negotiations in Paris. Early on, nations from the Global South didn't want anything to do with these negotiations. They had fears of arrested development, not the television show, but the idea that if we sign on to agreement that limits fossil fuels, then you're going to ask us to stop developing right where we are. You've spent a couple hundred years using fossil fuels to develop amazingly luxurious economies, and now we have a problem with them, and you're going to ask us not to use them? They, had, um, they were concerned about that, and so they thought that this was kind of another um, environmental protection scheme from the north that said, hey, protect the Brazilian rainforest. And they said, hey, wait a minute, where's your buffalo that used to range from you know, North Dakota down to Oklahoma? Why don't you reinstate that range and then we'll talk about protecting all of our natural resources. There was also a tremendous mistrust due to historic relationships from colonization. So nations were colonies when your parents were alive. That may seem like a long time ago, but uh, the last colony, maybe in mid-70s, Mozambique and Angola, uh, gained their independence from, um, uh, from Portugal. Uh, most of the African continent was colonized at some point. We know, that hopefully, the story of India and, and Gandhi's efforts there. But, so there was a lot of mistrust. Also, the, relation, the economic relationship between the Global South and the Global North has long been one of extraction of raw materials, we'll take, your, we'll take your rubber, we'll take your timber, we'll take your coal, we'll take it back to our country, turn it into more highly valued products, sell it back to you, that kind of thing. Finally though, they did engage in the process in these negotiations and said, wait a minute, we don't want to reject this, we want to be involved because our survival matters, and so we need a voice in what these treaties are going to look like. So early in those negotiations, other than common but differentiated responsibilities, the idea of climate justice was not instilled in a lot of the negotiations because it was primarily Annex One or highly developed nations that were saying, well, how much are you going to reduce? How much am I going to reduce? And the, the nations of the Global South were not a big part of the conversation. Starting in 2002, they, uh, groups like uh, nonprofits, like environmental organizations, like Amnesty International, um, Human Rights Watch, these kinds of organizations began holding parallel conferences. So as the UN uh, national delegations meet and not addressing climate justice, often in the very same cities at the very same time, they would rent out another space and meet to talk about issues that were of concern to them. So in 2002 was the first time that the principles of climate justice were instilled in any kind of uh, document. And these were largely drawn from already existing principles of environmental injustice. So in the United States, many, maybe some of you have studied this, um, things like garbage dumps, garbage incinerators, uh, heavy industrial production is often cited in poorer neighborhoods, uh, often non-white uh, dominated neighborhoods. So these principles, I'm not going to go through them all, but they called for full compensation of restoration and reparation. So this is a justice issue. We've been harmed. You caused it. We're feeling the effects you owe us compensation because our people are, uh, the, our agriculture is in decline, our coasts are eroding and flooding, these kinds of things. Uh, the idea of ecological debt, saying that the North has already used up too much of the atmospheric space, 
right? If we can only allow a certain number of um, greenhouse gases to accumulate in the car in the atmosphere, a lot of that, a large percentage of that has already been used up, and therefore you owe us an ecological debt. They wanted the affected communities to play a lead role. So this is a switch, right? They're saying, wait a minute, we want to be involved. We're the ones being impacted right now. We should take the lead on how to solve this, not those that cause the problem. Obviously, fossil fuel and extractive industries are held accountable. We're talking about justice. We're talking about accountability uh, for those that have done harm. This is a, a clearly identified source. And promoting clean, renewable, locally controlled energy production. So we've all heard about solar and wind and that kind of thing. But the interesting part that we don't often think about that is no longer are we going to be involved in systems where our energy production is uh, sited in one big plant located somewhere else and then that energy is distributed widely over power lines and things like that. If we're going to go solar and wind, etc., a lot of that is going to be kind of micro generation where you have solar panels on your roof, you have um, wind mills on, the, on your roofs as well that you control versus there's emissions happening somewhere over there. Does anyone know where Minneapolis gets their power? Or how it's generated? Coal, nuclear, I bet coal, but I'm not sure. Um, there might be enough water in the state to have a little bit of hydro, but um, we have no idea, right? That's the point, is because it's happening somewhere else. So we can flip on the switch and run this electricity, and uh, it's not the solar panels on our roof with a battery and a little meter that says, you only have two kilowatts left or whatever, you better conserve your energy. Um, also, no, fossil, no new fossil fuel uh, exploration or exploitation. They also wanted to prevent cultural and biodiversity loss. So again, this is not just an environmental issue. We're not talking about a few kind of mammal species disappearing. We're talking about small island nations not existing anymore. And their former populations being spread throughout countries as migrants and therefore uh, their culture disappearing, probably their language dissipating, uh, their former practices that were probably highly connected to that land that they lived on being, being gone. So wanting uh, protection for that. And as a justice issue, particularly looking at the most vulnerable uh, and the most susceptible to changes in the climate, women. So again, in most of the Global South, women do most of the work. They collect the water, they collect the firewood, they work the fields, and they take care of the kids all at the same time. I'm not sure what the men are doing. Um, in my experience, a lot of them are drinking. <laughs> um, well, women are going to be more impacted of those kind of changes in the climate. Youth, young people, right? It's your future. It's your you're going to ones that, that feel the impact of this more so than um, those of us that are older. The indigenous uh, who live off the land in a manner that has protected that land uh, in a sustainable manner, often for centuries, and the rights of future generations. We don't often think about how our um, actions right now impact future generations. Your kids, if you choose to have them under these conditions, are gonna live in a very different world, um, and one that is impacted by the decisions that we've made uh, during the last century. Additionally, they rejected the idea that uh, we can fix climate change through market-based solutions or technology. So, this is what got us into the problem, in their view, and so we don't want to use this. So these are things like carbon markets, where we can buy and sell the right to pollute, basically, is one of the predominant market-based solutions. Um, technological fixes, like dumping iron shillings into the ocean so that algae grows and um, um, absorbs more oxygen, or more, absorbs more carbon, and kind of uh, contributes to the deacidification of the ocean. Or making giant reflective islands in the ocean or as in the form of satellites to kick more of the solar rays back into uh, the earth. They're saying, no, that's not the problem. The problem is, is that's how we've approached things for so many years, and so we don't want to do that. There's also a heavy criticism and a rejection of transnational corporations that are becoming larger and larger, and a lot of the principles of climate justice point to this as uh, key actors in the contribution uh, to this problem. All right, so then we go forward a couple of years. In 2004, in Durban, South Africa, another document appears called the Durban Declaration on Carbon Trading. So solely kind of looking at 
this concern about um, the way we're going to try and solve this. They want to end fossil fuel extraction. They think that carbon markets are false solutions, right? This is becoming familiar. Carbon markets, in their mind, incentivizes the North to appropriate air, water, and forests and land in the South. So the idea of carbon markets is if I want to pollute here, I can either buy carbon credits from somebody else who's not going to pollute, or I can pay to create a forest somewhere else. Well, where's that going to be cheapest for me to do? Buy up agricultural land here in the United States, or uh, go to a country in the developing uh, south and buy up a whole swath of land, kick the people off of it, put up a tree farm and say, I've done my duty, now I can pollute. Um, and also, carbon markets fail to reduce northern uh, consumption. So this is one of the things that's driving climate change. And if we just try and trade things, if we trade carbon, then we can buy ourselves out of the problem, right? Oftentimes, uh, if you scroll all the way down when you're buying an airplane ticket, there'll be a little box you can pay like, here, pay $2.25 based on the mileage that you're about ready to fly, we'll plant this many trees for you, right? So I can say, oh, okay, I'll do that. Makes me feel a little bit better, doesn't prevent me from flying, right, which is still emitting carbon. Uh, and then a critique of our whole process about commodification of the earth. So the distrust of the market, distrust of global corporations, and a commodification of systems that they see as natural and that should be outside of the market, including our air, right? Do we want to start privatizing the space uh, in our atmosphere? In 2009, at the COP15, so COP is Conference of Parties, and 15 is just a count of how many we've had each year. So this is now 15 years after the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, began. And um, this was a, a moment in, in kind of history where we thought there was great hope that there was going to be a new treaty. Kyoto wasn't working. The United States never signed on. Canada initially did and then bailed out. Uh, Australia was about ready to bail out. And so we thought, all right, um, We've seen the problems emerge more and more. Copenhagen, something's going to happen. Mass protests trying to push towards that uh, end. That, and climate justice was a large part of this language. So a year into seven years, these ideas, this critique, has been kind of embedded into the mainstream. A year later, uh, Copenhagen failed. Uh, a year later, the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, which is a network of organizations on the continent that address climate change, uh, came out with a climate justice manifesto. This said, we call on developing nations or developing countries to acknowledge they have already used more than a fair share uh, and sustainable share of the Earth's atmospheric space. So this is that debt that they owe again. They must repay this debt through deep domestic emissions reductions. So the North needs to cut, not the South. We haven't contributed to this. We're still trying to develop. The North needs to cut. End over consumption. Transfer technology. So part of the argument as well in regards to climate justice is you've generated this problem. The opportunities for us to develop using fossil fuels are becoming more and more limited. You need to transfer that technology like solar, like wind, to our societies. You're not going to make us buy it. You're going to give us the instructions, and we're going to make it ourselves or something to that effect, that, that we need to have more open access to those kinds of innovations. Uh, and then finance required to enable us to follow a less polluting pathway without compromising our development. So this concern of arrested development is still there, part of uh, climate justice. Also, how much of the Earth's temperature should be allowed to rise? Allowed is a, a loose term. We haven't quite gotten control over it yet. But um, climate justice argues that it should be 1.5 degrees or less as a planetary average Celsius. Uh, we're at like 0.7 right now, so we're halfway there. Um, but the argument was, the other number being floated was 2 degrees Celsius as a planetary average, and nations of the global south said, that might be fine on a global level, but even a 2 degree average impacts us in a way that's unacceptable. So we're shooting for 1.5 degrees as the kind of agreed upon limit. So they want countries to compensate them for this historical emissions. So we're not going to look at, oh, we're just one big globe. We've all contributed to this. Let's all chip in and solve it. No, no, no. Climate justice says this is not a problem we all created. There are particular people, and we need to look at that historically. 
So the polluter, not the poor, pays for the problem. And a rather biting quote uh, from this manifesto, it's a cruel irony indeed that a people who have lived for so long in harmony with nature, imprinting the lightest of carbon footprints on the earth, are now suffering and living in abject poverty due to the damaging effects of greenhouse gases emitted by developing countries. So furthering uh, their efforts to develop. Lastly, in 2010, in uh, Cochabamba, in Bolivia, they called kind of an alternative conference together of organizations and developed this people's agreement that was a heavy critique of capitalism, said we're gonna question this entire system um, that's contributed to climate change using language like we're decolonizing the atmosphere. Again, recognizing this real historical relationship between nations of the North and nations of the South that has often been exploitative. Calling for that technology transfer that we've seen in others. Uh, this was an interesting one. They wanted the countries in the developing North to be open to climate migrants. Many people argue that this is going on right now with the war in Syria, that in large part that was sparked by a, a, a severe drought uh, that put people in uncompromising positions that caused um, uprisings that's now leading to uh, huge migrant flows into uh, Europe. And they wanted to establish an international tribunal of conscience that would uh, oversee uh, the development of this, the, the development or the implementation of the People's Agreement in Cochabamba, and kind of hold the world accountable uh, for climate change. And they took it a little bit further down and said the maximum increase that we need to shoot for is one degree uh, Celsius. And then compensation that we've seen in others. So, uh, common threads, consideration for historical emissions, not just per capita national emissions, not national emissions as equivalent, but historical emissions. Compensation for the loss and damage received uh, or being experienced. No carbon markets to solve the problem. Uh, technology transfer, rejection of a fossil fuel powered future, and 1.5 degrees Celsius. So these are common threads throughout a lot of these. There is no, um, like, despite all the different manifestos, there's no singular argument. It's not a monolithic kind of claim of climate justice, but these are uh, some common threads. All right, based on the time here, like a good professor, I'm way over prepared. And so I'm gonna skip to um, some conclusions here in regards to survey data from the People's Climate March in New York City. And then we'll look at some uh, from Paris. So in 2000, late September of 2014, um, 350.org started by Bill McKibben, which I mentioned earlier, and 1,500 other organizations organized the People's Climate March in New York City. There were 300 to 400,000 people who participated. Um, I was able to work with a team of about 20 students from like Forest College, Columbia, and NYU to work the crowd. We had one day to do it. Um, and we collected over a thousand surveys. So on questions in regards to classic climate justice questions, should developing nations uh, reduce their emissions at the same rate as developed countries? Uh, there was very low support for access of other countries still developing using fossil fuels. So most said uh, that they disagreed that countries of the developing South should still be able to emit fossil fuels or greenhouse gas emissions. There was even lower levels of support for people who were over 30. Um, other than that, interestingly, there were very few kind of individual indicators that were statistically <coughs> significant. Not political ideology, uh, not gender, not race, um, what else did I measure? Religion, which tells us, it's, you know, you might think, oh, well, that's not very interesting statistically, but the problem is, is that it tells us that it's a very broad belief and that we can't distinguish that very much. There was, however, broad support for the climate justice call for compensation uh, for loss and damage to nations of the Global South. And then I put in a question there about China, because while we saw that China is the predominant net emitter, they're also, because of their population size, um, a per capita small emitter. And we also think of China as booming economically but we're primarily talking about the coastal cities. And millions have been lifted out of poverty in China, 
but there are hundreds of millions uh, in the countryside that are still living in poverty. So China uh, has still a long way to go to develop, even though we feel uh, competitive pressure from them in the global economy. So I argued that uh, I proposed a question about whether China should still be allowed to emit in order to develop emit fossil fuels. Uh, and most strong majorities said no, and that strength was even higher among whites compared to non-whites, and those that were over 30 compared to those uh, that were under 30. If we jump then to uh, the People's Climate March in um, for the Paris uh, events. So Paris was a little more complicated because this meeting started four days after the most recent terrorist attacks. And so the initial protest, which was scheduled for the 29th, they were expecting 200,000 people, uh, was canceled or deemed illegal. So there was a much smaller crowd that came out um, into the Place de Republique. Uh, the police showed up with tear gas and whatnot to disperse them. So on that day, I got like 30 surveys, which is not enough. So I had to change my plans a little bit. There were protest events which I was able to go to, collect survey data, but I also went to the actual COP meeting, and there's an entire kind of civil society pavilion. So these are NGOs uh, that have booths and things like that, and I was able to survey members of civil society there. So one of my newer variables in this one is protesters versus people who also participate in uh, the formal kind of meetings. So uh, they want, uh, regarding the question about developing nations to reduce at the same rate as developed nations, those who were only outside protesters, not participating in the COP meetings, um, wanted developing nations to reduce at the same rate, uh, and the young also wanted developing nations to reduce at the same rate. So not great support for climate justice there. Additionally, they predominantly rejected market-based solutions like carbon trading. Uh, liberals on a political ideology scale of liberal, moderate to conservative uh, were more likely, as were residents of the global north, outside protesters, and middle to lower class um, self-identified people, like self-identified class relative to their, to their fellow countrymen versus the world, uh, were more likely to reject uh, those kind of carbon-based solutions. So we did have um, we did have an agreement in Paris. It's called the Paris Agreement. Uh, did climate justice win in any respect? In one respect, it did, because there was an agreement. Finally, 21 years. So this was COP 21. That means 21 years of negotiating. We have the vast majority of countries on board uh, in regards to a formal but not legally binding commitment to uh, reduce. Unfortunately, there was no specific finance or technology commitments. Uh, in past conferences, the US has said, by 2020, we will help to mobilize $100 billion a year in order to help nations of uh, the global south. It's unclear whether that's loans, whether it's grants, whether that includes current development aid or any other kind of assistance that we already give them. Uh, a lot of the developing nations are saying this needs to be uh, new money. This isn't like you know, helping us develop schools. This is helping us uh, stay alive. The idea of loss and damage, right? So people are being harmed. Justice needs to be served. Loss and damage was not even discussed. The United States in particular, our negotiation team said, we're not even, we're not talking about um, liability, who's responsible, who's uh, liable, or uh, has to compensate other countries. So that is no part of, uh, not only the negotiations, but the final agreement. There is, however, a list of suggestions on ways that uh, the nations of the global north might help countries who are most vulnerable. And these include, provide them with early warning systems, right? And guess what? Uh, that super hurricane's coming. I hope you can find some shelter. Uh, good luck. We paid for this, you know. Um, emergency preparedness, risk assess assessment, resilience, etc. Nothing that would actually uh, help them uh, kind of prevent this, but rather you're screwed, you're going to get slammed by storms and things like that. We're sorry. Here's the best we can do. But, um, Let's see, what else do I have here? Da, 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 da. 
They did, interestingly, climate justice also won in that we committed to uh, limit uh, temperature increases to 1.5 degrees, which is, was a surprise to all analysts. Going in, and for the 20 years prior to this, it had been two degrees, two degrees, two degrees. Uh, and at the end of the last week, uh, the United States and some others agreed to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the industrial levels. Uh, again, we're already halfway there, so that may seem small, uh, but the general variation in the climate over uh, human occupation of this planet has been uh, quite small. Uh, the language is not legally binding, uh, implies commitment, um, reach the global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. We're going to do our best. But the problem is that there's this giant emissions gap. They basically said the world celebrated, you may have heard of that at the end of the agreement, uh, it's like December 12th or something like that. There was this huge celebration in the press. The world comes together, we're, we're going to do this, we're going to tackle this problem. The problem is that there's an existing emissions gap. So every nation prior to the meeting in Paris submitted a proposal about how much they were going to reduce emissions. It's voluntary, uh, they could do it in their own methodology. Uh, the United States is going to start phasing out coal and support for natural gas and things like that. The problem is the commitments that we made as a planet lead to 3.5 degrees Celsius increase. Um, that's beyond catastrophic, just from a scientific perspective. So if we don't, it's not like we came to an agreement in Paris and this is over, and we finally did it and we can move on. Um, this is going to be an ongoing debate when we see that we made this agreement, but emissions continue to rise. What's going on? They may rise less slowly, but I assure you they will continue to rise. So we're still left with this very vague kind of language about common but differentiated responsibilities. I'm going to stop there. Um, we've got a few minutes before 4 o'clock. I am um, more than willing to take questions. If uh, we don't get to one of your questions for any reason, please feel free to email me. Uh, beer, which is my last name, beer at lakeforest.edu. Uh, sometimes I think I get students in my class and they're like, oh, they're looking through the catalog. Right? Anyway, um, I'm happy to take any questions, comments. Yes? Um, what do you see, okay, so like in my mind, I see the biggest like climate change um, legislation being like the Kyoto Protocol and then this COP21. What do you yeah. see as the biggest difference between those two? Or do you see much of it? Difference? Yeah, there's a huge difference. So in, in Kyoto, remember that it was really only talking about 41 Annex I nations reducing their emissions. In the, in the Paris Agreement, almost every country, uh, even the developing nations of the South, have submitted proposals for how they will reduce emissions. So that's um, one of the key differences. Um, Kyoto was, was, there was an effort to make it legally binding, and that was one of the negotiating sticking points for a long time. Uh, Paris, there are like really kind of easy parts of it that are legally binding, but there are other parts, and part of the problem is that Obama said, look, we want to do something, but if you require this to be legally binding, it's not going anywhere because you can't get it through the Senate. Uh, so the Kyoto Protocol was voted down like 99 to zero, um, and it, it was before it even came up, the Senate voted and said, there's no way we're considering anything. We, we ban anybody from considering anything unless the developing countries are on board as well, primarily concerned about the growth and economic competition of China. The other thing to remember about China is why have China emissions grown? What are they making? They're making our stuff, right? So it's just like we've transferred a lot of our emissions over there, and now we're blaming them for having high emissions. Any other questions or comments, concerns? Yeah. Now, I agree with what you've been, what you've been talking about, how developing nations have had this huge gap. But don't you think the issue is that the reason why not very many people, or not very many nations get on it is because, I'm not saying the developing nations are feel like they're getting picked on, but is, you're, you're soloing, uh, soloing it out when it should be a, a worldwide effort. Isn't that kind sure. of what I mean, that's what I'm getting the sense of that. I understand and I agree with your statement that there is a huge gap, but. It, it's just that way. That's how it is. You know, we can't. We can reduce it, but you can't just affect. You can't just say, "Oh, the United States is the worst offender." You're gonna. You're gonna pay for all our damages and everything. 
You know, that's how I think why it's hard to stick in America because we don't sure. like to see that as we have to pay for everything. Yep, I agree. I mean, I, I agree that um, a lot of our resistance to it, we are the only nation with an organized political party that does not believe the signs of climate change. No other nation on this planet has that. Um, and that's, the reason is because it is a threat to our lifestyle. So if we talk about the changes that we have to make, um, we're talking about, you know, we've had a trend since the, probably the mid 70s, our houses have gotten larger and larger. If we're gonna reduce these emissions, that means if we have like a carbon tax or some other things that have been proposed, that means your electric bill on your much larger house now is gonna go sky high. Your products are gonna cost more, those kinds of things. So yes, I agree that we've resisted it because it's a threat to our lifestyle and we, um, it's not great having the finger pointed at us. I don't know, well, I, I don't agree that that is not just in some way. So should it be a global effort? Yes. If um, so just in the last five years or so, if we took all of the developing countries and all of the developed countries, it used to be that the 41 highly developed countries emitted way more. The other, whatever it was, 150 <coughs> developing nations were down here. Collectively, they have now surpassed the cumulative emissions of uh, highly developed nations, but there's three times as many of them, just to remember. Um, so it's kind of like individual action. You could become a zero carbon emitter today for the rest of your life, and it would make zero difference unless we do this collectively. Because you could you know, take cold showers and not use electricity and things like that, and if other countries continue to grow their emissions, then it's not gonna change. We're well, as still you said earlier, you could be still affected 50 years down the road no matter what. Like right. Just, yeah. But I also don't think that it's fair to say from our position of relative luxury, which is hard to say in the United States because there's certainly plenty of people who uh, live in poverty in the United States and as students, you're probably like, wait a minute, I'm collecting all this debt, I want a job, I work my butt off. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you in this room have had parents that have been laid off, things like that. So it doesn't seem all hunky-dory in the United States, but relative, to what other people experience relative to people who don't have access to electricity, who have to walk a mile to get a bucket of water, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that we need to consider that in some way um, if this is gonna be a just but I'm not just saying we just drop the gap, like yeah. keep it in mind. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. Yeah, I hear you, I hear you. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? So, sure. so one of the things I was curious about in the survey responses was this difference between people who thought I mean, kind of like what we're discussing, like this difference between people who were engaged and thought there should be differential yep. Um, yep. repair of climate change versus uh -huh. those who think everybody should do it at the same speed. And I'm curious if that's partly, like if, if part of your analysis of this is it's a different understanding of the historical privilege that we've been able to build our economy here. And I'm also curious, what are the, like, what are the implications of that particularly for youth involved in these movements. Mm -hmm. So like, like as we try to get our campuses on board with mm -hmm. climate justice, what does this tell us about how we should be right. talking about this? Yeah, I, w I think you're right, but it, I'm speculating because I don't, we like to base our yeah. assumptions on empirical data, right? So I, I don't have that, but I, that would be a great kind of follow-up question in regards to like, well, why don't you think that should be considered? So here, so for example, uh, should developing nations reduce at the same rate uh, by certain age categories, and this is a little bit of manipulation of the data. I'm looking for something significant here, some breaking point, so it was 18 to 39, which is you know, not like a gener classic generational, like 20 to 29, 30 to 39, et cetera, but this is where the breaking point hits with statistical significance. And so yeah, you do see a higher rate, 61% of them saying we, that developing nations need to reduce at the same rate. So I think that it's a little bit of a lack of context, historical context, again, not having lived in a planet where there were colonies, not having lived in a planet where, I mean, the World Bank has kind of become less evil, right? So there's not been the same kind of structural adjustment programs and, and manipulation that the 1980s saw, maybe. And so there was, I think there was, and now we have globalization, we kind of have this idea that we're, our, our production is flowing across these trade routes and things like that. And, it's a more shared experience than our kind of political history of the past. Um, 
but also a, a greater urgency because they're younger and they're like, you know, I'd love to live a full life, but, but what have you left me? And so I think in preparing and teaching about this, I think that historical context is absolutely crucial because we didn't just arrive at this problem today. Um, and so, um, and it's, it's unfair according to the, the principles and the calls of climate justice to not consider the differentiation in the contribution and then and the consequences and then how we should deal with it. Uh, yeah, back there. I'm interested in where you see emerging moral voices um, arising, um, how a, a chorus of moral voices can come together. Um, uh, I know re religious anthropocentrism has been a problem in the past, um, but for example, Pope Francis's Laudato Si, and are there, do you see possibly emerging? Yeah, I think so. I don't know if it's a chorus yet, but there, there's, uh, I think there's, increasingly it's a chorus and there's definitely multiple solo acts going on, right? So the Pope's encyclical, they called, it was heavily critical of capitalism, right. it was heavily critical of climate change and not addressing it. Um, other religious communities, like the evangelical community, is seeing the uh, damage to the planet as damage to God's creation um, and calling for action in that, in that manner. Um, I think that there are, uh, I think there are people in the business community that want this addressed, and part of the desire to be addressed is just so it's a level playing field, because there is pressure from consumers. You can't go out there and buy um, goods that have a little thing on them or a little seal that might say, you know, um, carbon neutral or produced with solar power or whatever. Well, those companies are doing that because there's a market for it. But they're also at a disadvantage in some ways where they're having to pay more for that energy relative to our increasingly cheap fossil fuels. Um, and so they want to level the business field by saying everyone has to abide by these kind of climate rules. Where we want to do this, but we're being out-competed in, in many ways. Um, I think other little things like the tiny house movement, yeah. right? I mean, there's like shows on I don't know TV, but those like home, that's not Home Shopping Network, but Home and Garden Network, that's what I, yeah, HGTV, right? There's whole shows on like how people are living much, much smaller and more efficiently, and we're all like, whoa, that's super cool, I love a tiny house. Um, so that's, a, I mean, it's not prominent, but it's there, and it's, it's, I think it's a sign in our culture that we're starting to question the size of our kind of conspicuous consumption. Those are the things that I would see, uh, yeah. As a follow-up to that, I'm curious whether there's ever discussion about a consumption tax in the United States. So if you're buying bigger houses that require more energy or right. bigger cars, you pay more. Right. And yeah. I don't know why we haven't instituted something like that. I think most of the rec most of the recommendations are at the production side. Uh, I think because there's fewer points that they would have to regulate, right? So if you do consumption. You have to calculate the carbon that went into the thing. You have to calculate, um, you know, does that include shipping? So if I buy something that was shipped from China, does it cost more because it went on a boat that was burning fossil fuels, that kind of thing. So the complexity is greater than, there's a coal plant, I know how much it emits every year, I'm gonna tax that carbon. So there, there is, I mean, we don't like the word tax, so politically viable um, programs of carbon taxes have not really emerged in the United States very strong. We do have a couple of, so in, 19, in the early 90s, uh, the idea of cap and trade was prominent among both parties. Uh, Joe Lieberman and somebody else, I forget the Republican, co-sponsored a bill to introduce a cap and trade system where you say, this is how much carbon we can emit. Here's your permits. Every year we're gonna take away some of those permits. So you're gonna have to figure out, you either use technology to reduce your carbon or you're gonna have to pay to buy somebody else's. Therefore, hey, if I have a permit to, to, uh, to burn carbon and somebody else wants to buy it, then that incentivizes me to reduce as well, then I can sell it. That kind of, that's what carbon trading, the idea behind that is. Um, that has not been revived at a national level, but there are regional. California has one, the Northeast states have a kind of a carbon trading market, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, here and then, and then back. Okay, yeah. I have nothing exacting, but one 
that's no America. We don't like taxing, from what I understand, and as you said. But wouldn't the more better approach be to more incentivize how we construct buildings? I mean, I understand we build big houses, but to build houses that have energy efficiency, such as with geothermal, uh, at least some solar power systems, to at least like you were talking about micro, wouldn't it be more to better to incentivize that? I mean, you, you said you don't want to have a marketable. Uh, I can't remember what you said about that. Well, there, yeah, and so there's not support for, for a lot of this amongst the principles of climate justice. We do have some of that, right? So taxes are disincentives, right? So if you tax something, the idea is that, well, we're trying to deter people from using it because it costs more. Cigarettes, gasoline, that kind of thing. We do have incentives in that um, different states and have regulations where if you put $20,000 worth of solar panels on your roof, they'll refund you $5,000 in your taxes, stuff like that. Um, everyone's so excited about the new Tesla that's coming out. There's been 250,000 pre-orders for a vehicle that's not going to be available until late next year. And it's going to be thirty dollars to $35,000, but in some states, with tax incentives, by buying an electric car, you could get the cost down to like $25,000. So incentivizing people to buy that instead of a less fuel-efficient fossil fuel burning vehicle. Which, by the way, electric cars are still fossil fuel burning. If you plug it into your outlet and your outlet is charged by coal power generated electricity, it is not a clean car. Okay, so, so we need to incentivize more houses that use, that utilize the stuff that we have. I mean, we have batteries now for houses. I mean. Yes, Elon Musk has proposed that as well. So the founder of Tesla and kind of the brainchild behind Tesla has recently said that they are going to move their battery technology into the household level. You can have a battery pack for good uh, solar power as well. So the incentives are there. Um, I don't know how extensive they are. They're obviously not enough based on the fact that our market, if you just go off the market incentives, it says um, the only kind of message from the market should be the prices, right? That tells us whether I should get into that business, whether I should buy the product, that kind of thing. It shouldn't be the government or some other entity determining that. Well, now the problem we have is that for a while, oil was $100, $150 a barrel. And that incentivized more people to get into technology in the market. So now we have shale oil in North Dakota, in, um, I even said that like in North Dakota. Hey. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> uh, North Dakota and Canada. <laughs> and, um, and there's such a glut. There's such a glut of oil on the market now that it's, it's not viable for, com for companies to even produce this stuff anymore, they're losing money. And but that market incentive says, why would I pay 20 grand for solar when my gas bill keeps dropping for heat and my electric bill keeps dropping because we have a coal-fired power plant? So that's where you know market incentives versus disincentives. I agree with you that we politically in the United States we tend to hate taxes and it's not very viable uh, in the current political atmosphere. So. I'd like to make a quick pitch. So. I think we perhaps should move into the hallway and enjoy some snacks while we discuss the remaining questions with us. But for those who are interested in this very topic, McAllister is hosting the Regional Power Dialogue tonight. So I'm going to give you the details. So at 5 o'clock in the Hill Ballroom in Kagan Commons, which is the big building right at Snelling and Grand. Um, and, and that's a meeting with a lot of the Public Utilities Commission and legislators who control power. It's a discussion about the Clean Power Plan, and that will kind of continue on in this region for a while. So it's a, a chance to think about this. For those who are interested and want to get involved on campus, you can contact me and Valerie, because we would like to make, for example, this building use more than 3% of its solar energy, or have its solar panels supply more than 3% of its energy. So please join us in thanking Professor Deere, I believe if we go out over there, there are snacks in the hallway.